let's now see some more complex data types. So here you have the fixed point arithmetic. But first, note that in addition to the basic types that you have in scale, you can also um, use more advanced data types which have been implemented in the Mamba compiler already. That you know, uh, even for the more advanced data type, we always rely on the basic types we've seen before, right? So here, as I said, we have the fixed point type, which is stored internally as an S int, uh, so here X, in, in this range. And we also have a public F to represent the, uh, uh, the, the fixed point arithmetic. And so the associated uh, value is uh, X times two to the minus F, right? So you basically take your X and you shift it by F bits to the right. Um, so what you can do with this type is addition, of course, which is uh, free basically because you don't have you don't require any communication to add to fixed point values. And you also have multiplication, which is a bit more costly than in the case of regular S int types, because once you actually have done the multiplication, you also need to truncate by F, otherwise you'd uh, increase the um, decimal part, right? So that's a slightly more expensive operation than on regular S ints. And you also have much more already implemented operation on those types uh, that you can use us in the documentation or in the previous slides when we talked about it at the beginning. Um, so a, a bit more details on how fixed point arithmetic works. So because we work over a finite field, there are some restriction on the size and precision we can have because our field is is has a, a fixed length, right? So this precision can be changed as well as the uh, noise joining parameters kappa that you see here. But this should be done with care. So what do we need for correctness? We need that f is less than k. So uh, if you remember, uh, f is uh, the fixed point and k uh, represents the range for which x can be defined. And we also want that 2 times k plus kappa is uh, less than the, the bit length of p because we want to be able to perform multiplication basically, right? So by default, Mamba gives you some values, but you can change those parameters using uh, these commands. Right. We also have floating point arithmetic already implemented in the compiler, so here's the types are S float and C float and the representation is a bit more complex because we have first a significant V on L bits and exponent P on K bits and we have a bit uh, a sign bit S a zero flag zero and an error flag uh, R. All those uh, values V, P, S, Z and R, R are all uh, secrets, right? Which is which was not the case for the fixed point case where the f value was actually public. Now, given all this value, uh, the, the floating point value, which uh, is represented by all these uh, parameters, is given by this equation, right? So you can see here that we have the sine bit. So if if the sine bit is one, then we have a negative number. We also have the zero bit. You can see that if the zero bit is one, then we have zero. And then you have your uh, significant and your exponent here. So um, here again, there are default parameters which can be tweaked, but with caution. And contrary to um, fixed point arithmetic, I want to stress here that um, multiplication is much cheaper than additions, which can be a bit counterintuitive at first, but it's because um, it's very hard to deal with the exponent here uh, when doing addition. So for floating point arithmetic 2, we have some constraints on all parameters. So here we want that 2 times L plus kappa is less than or uh, field size. So here the P is for the 
prime which we use uh, to define our finite field and this is also because we want to be able to do multiplications and by default we have this parameter so here p is the size of the exponent uh, which uh, shouldn't be confused with the size of the field um, once again you can change these parameters by execu executing those commands but you should be careful that uh, by doing so you won't cause any unwanted overflow or any uh, uh, security issue for example if you reduce kappa to be too low so in addition to those types we also define a, math a maths library um, where we have a lot of advanced protocol which are already defined within the compiler to allow programmers to access ready to use protocols to compute or approximate some functions so in, in particular Mamba provides trigonometric functions, exponentiation, logarithm, etc. Uh, all the available advanced protocol can be found with their details in the documentation. Alright, let's see how it go about interfacing scale Mamba with your own programs uh, in terms of uh, I.O. and also we are going to see how to perform restarts in, in Mamba. So to provide inputs to the program you can of course provide your inputs directly in the code uh, as you can see here. Also since all participating parties will need to see the source code while well, it does not hide anything. That's why Scale Mamba provides a way to give inputs from external applications similar to what we've seen in the demo in the previous video. Since our system is composed of uh, the programming language Mamba and the virtual machine scale we have two sides to the story right. So first let's see what happens uh, in Mamba. So if you want to get some input from a, a party you use the sint.get private input from and give the party ID which is the ID of the party you want the input from and the channel ID. You can think of channels as uh, modes of input which you can uh, program later on. Um, and to output something out of scale you can use the private output again um, by giving the party ID and the channel but you can also use uh, the public output function if you want uh, everyone to see the output of your program. Uh, note that whether it be input or output values in and out of scale, we now have to see what happens in the virtual machine to resolve those hooks. Also note that even though it's not uh, demonstrated here, you, uh, when you use this command you can actually get back an error code say if you wanted to open a file in the C++ code and it failed then you can actually choose what to do in the Mamba program. On, this, on the C++ side what we want to do is to create our own input output uh, class which has to be derived from the input output base class which is already defined. So then we want to actually implement all the commands we have called in Mamba. The first one is what happens when uh, we call open channel in Mamba. So this function takes in a channel number as we've seen before and here uh, the only thing that it does is uh, depending on which uh, channel number you give it opens either the input file or the output file. Next on the list is the private input JFP function which is the one which is called when uh, in Mamba we write get private input from. So here again we have a channel and what this does basically here is it takes uh, the input value from the file and converts it into a finite field element and returns this value. We also have to see what happens for the output. So here we define the private output GFP function which is the one which is called uh, when in Mamba we call the private output function, right? So this function takes in a finite field element and a channel again. And so what this does here is just write the output to the output file, basically. And we finally have the close channel function, which in our case just close the files. And the final touch is to tell scale which uh, IO class to use, right? So 
what you have to do is look for the player.cpp file in the source folder and replace this line which uh, instantiates the IO with the input output simple default class and replace it with your uh, new input output trick class. One last thing to see in the IO class is the restart functionality. The thing is, scale member doesn't really allow to disso dissociate the offline and online phases. So we provide a way to do programmatic restart so you don't lose all your offline data which you already produced. So the idea is here is that in the member code at the end of your program you call the restart function and this will uh, then call your um, input output class with the trigger function inside the scale machine. So at this point all the offline data is kept but the online runtime restarts from the beginning. Note that by default the same program will be executed again. However, by changing the code of the trigger hook in the scale, uh, as we've seen before for the uh, opening and closing of the channels and the private input and output functions, you could decide to swap uh, the program for a different one. To do so, you'd use uh, the schedule.load program function to load the des desired program. Okay, let's dig a deep deeper into how the compiler actually works. So, um, so this is a full pipeline from a .mpc file, which is the file, the extension that you use when you want to write your uh, MPC program. To down to the, the bytecode, uh, which the scale machine can actually interpret. So, so your MPC files get compiled by the Mamba compiler into this kind of, of uh, assembly file, which then is given as an input to the SCASM program, which uh, uh, outputs the bytecode that the scale machine can eventually read. Let's see some of the internal tricks that we have. So. How do we compile loops in Mamba? So there are two ways that uh, Mamba can compile loops. First one demonstrated here is by writing the Python code for the loop, right? So this is a Python loop, a classical Python loop. And what happens is that during the compilation step, the Python code is actually evaluated. So the, the loop is actually evaluated and so what you get out of this is an unrolled loop in the assembly file, as you can see here. Note that if the loop is actually on secret register as it's here, then doing so may require lots of opening runs, right? So you'd have 100 opening runs because you have multiplication of two secrets inside the loop. Um, however, uh, the schism assembler actually proposes some optimization switches which would actually merge the communication runs that can be merged. So every run which are, uh, every every opening which are on the same depth, uh, if you think about circuit, would be merged into only one opening round. The compiler does implement branching though, which we can use to define uh, for loops too, as we will see a bit a bit later. So this branching quick feature allows us to write the if then statement uh, as such. However, each new block, so this is a block and this is also a block, defines uh, a new scope. And a basic block basically uh, ends at every jump instruction. As you can see here, we have new blocks here and here because we have jump instructions. Therefore, inside the if then else then statement here, we are writing to a new locally defined x value, right? So we, although we have x defined here, inside this if then statement, x is a, a newly locally defined uh, value. And so the compiler does not even produce the code on the right because uh, you end up with a read before write register error because you are trying to read from to read from x because of this plus equal term uh, before you are actually uh, before you've actually written to it. Uh, 
and so this is where memory comes into play. So here we have written again the same program, but this time the correct one using the mem values. So here again we define the x and assign it uh, a c int uh, 0. And then we store this x in memory. And uh, whenever we want to write to memory at the same location, we can just use the result.write function. And this program will actually compile and have the behavior that we wanted to have. And then in the end, we get back the result by um, using the read function on the memory location and put that into x and we can then print this x value. You can actually write the same piece of code using the decorator syntax that we have in member and it may be a bit more obvious here that uh, everything which is inside the if statement is a new block. right? Okay, in this slide we're going to see how to use arrays and also the other ways to define for loops. So arrays behave exactly like mem values and can be created as such. So here n is the size of the array. Uh, because they behave exactly like mem values, you can modify uh, them inside uh, functions and loops. We don't have the same issue as we had before. Here we show four different versions of doing the same thing. So first is the Pythonic way that we've already seen and which, which uh, depending on which optimization flag you give to the uh, ASCASM will merge uh, to the round as, as much as it can. Second, uh, you can use uh, here the Mamba decorator and this will cause no merging at all that could actually make the final protocol much more expensive in terms of rounds. So the compilation will be faster because you don't have any unrolling, but on the other hand, the execution of the MPC protocol uh, might be slower. Uh, the third version is a kind of a mix of the first two and you will basically unroll uh, the, the loop with uh, at most uh, NP operation per rounds. So you kind of have a trade-off here between compilation and execution. And finally, you have the same uh, version as version three, but this time with using multiple thread in the uh, online step. And here you uh, are also unrolling uh, your loop. Um, where with, with um, NP operation per loop, but you also spawn NT threads. So, and so in theory, it should be faster if your machine can support these many threads. Okay, finally, there are a couple of parameters which are very important to keep in mind to make sure that everything behaves as you want it and everything remains secure. So at a setup level, you have the size of the prime, which defines the finite field that you will be working with. And this is a very important parameter because everything, every operation in, in scale member happens over this field. Uh, so uh, the emulation of the arithmetic is done over this field and so its size is, is very important. And at setup, you can also choose the access structure that you want to be secure against. Um, at the program level, as we've seen before, there are a couple of parameters that you can tweak. Uh, in particular, you can tweak the bit, le bit length that is used for, uh, for example, comparison. Because if you remember correctly, we said that uh, in, for comparison to work, uh, the values have to be bounded. So this is what this bit length means. And you can also choose the statistical security parameter that we use for noise droning. Remember that it has to be big enough so that uh, the program or like the, the protocols are still secure. In this last section, we are going to see some of the new features that Scale Member has to offer. So first, we are going to look at local functions with a small example. And then we are going to look at garbled circuit and finally, how to do a secure distributed setup. Let's see a small recap on memory. Um, so we've seen this diagram before, but so far we've only really used uh, registers. And in this section, we are actually going to use the stacks because this is how uh, 
we are going to pass arguments to our local functions and also our gabble circuits. So a local function is a function that does not involve any opening, which means that it has to be linear, a linear function on the secrets. Uh, so you should know that it's a function that lives in the C++ code and therefore can be executed much faster than via Mumba bytecode and it's also potentially easier to write. So how do we call a local function in scale Mumba? So you should know that it, it's very similar to traditional assembly function call. So it's a six step process and first in Mumba you are going to push the argument on the stacks. So the stacks we've seen before, right? And then you are going to call your local function. So that's what you do in Mumba. Then in scale, so in the C++ code, you will want to pop the argument from the stack. So you get them in your C++ code and you execute whatever function you want to, to compute with the arguments that you've just popped. And then you, at the end of your function in scale, you want to push the result back on the stacks. And in Mumba, you can pop the result after the, the, the function call to continue any computation you want to do. So basically you use the stacks to communicate between the to, between Mumba and scale so to speak. Okay so let's look at how you use local functions to code the um, element wise product of two vectors. So let's define our vector CPA and CPB which are both an uh, array of five elements. We then fill them in this for loop and now we tackle the actual, the, the actual uh, local function code. So first, we are going to push uh, our size on on the Regin stack, right? So what happens here is you know, the Regin stack has the uh, element five, which is uh, the size of our arrays. And then one by one, we are going to push all the elements of our two vectors. So using, executing these for loops give us uh, this result. So you can see that the C in stack now is filled with um, the elements of our vector. So once we have filled all stacks, we want to actually do the function call, which is this step here. So now what happens from the C++ side? So here in the C++ we have our stacks which are filled and we want our code to actually take uh, those two vectors from the stacks and compute the element-wise product. So first what we do is we pop um, the regint to know the size of our vectors, right? And then we uh, instantiate our vectors and we once again pop from the C in stack to get first vector 2 and then vector 1. Um, then we perform the local computation here, which is as we see the element-wise product of our two vectors. And in the end, we push back the result um, to the C in stack so that Mumba can actually access this result. And so now back to Mumba, we actually are here. So after the function curl, we want to um, pop the result from the C in stack back into uh, registers which are accessible to Mumba. And so this is what this step does. And now uh, CP out is an array which contains the result of this local function call. You may be wondering why this call is uh, on like 65537. So the answer is for every local function you want to add to the system, you have to register them and pair them with a unique ID number. And so once you've written down your uh, function in C++, you want to register it into this source local local function dot cpp right and you should always remember that you cannot do secret secret multiplication in those calls now if you have a functionality which you know would be more efficient to compute using a gabble circuit so basically a circuit which uh, directly act, uh, acts on the bits of your data then you can actually use uh, scale to switch from linear sequencing schemes to gable circuit. So gable, gable circuits only take uh, s regin data uh, in and output uh, s regin data too. So to define your own circuits, you want to first write the VHDL code of the function you want to execute. Um, note that inputs and outputs must be multiple of 64 bits in length because uh, OS regint data 
uh, is defined over 64 bits. Then you want to compile your VHDL file into Netlist and convert it to uh, the Bristol Fashion format for which we provide a tool to, to do this. Uh, and finally you want to, as you did for the local function, you have to register your circuits in the system uh, through this file, which we are going to see exactly how to do that. So for example, we provide the AES128 circuit that we already designed via GL and that we already converted into the Bristol format. And so if you wanted to register this circuit, given this uh, Bristol format, you just um, modify this function uh, accordingly. And so this step is very similar to local function, but the next one also. So if you wanted to call the AES gable circuit from Mumbai, you would also uh, use stacks. So first you'll define your variables key, uh, message and ciphertext. So key and message are the inputs and ciphertext is going to be the output, right? So first you push uh, into the s rigging stack um, every parameter that your function takes in. So here we push in the key and the message. And then we call uh, our gable circuit on the uh, number that we've used to register our circuit. And finally, once uh, it's done, we actually want to pop the result out of the s rigging stack. And we pop this into our ciphertext variable. Note that in the previous example, we've, uh, we started with s rigging and we ended up with s rigging, but you can actually switch uh, from s into s rigging automatically. And, and this is done using the debit work from Rotary and Hood, and the version which is implemented is a, a newer one. Um, but you should know that it's uh, somewhat expensive to do, though. Okay, in a bit more detail, what happens when you switch from linear sequence sharing scheme to a garbled circuit is is represented in this figure. So, uh, very briefly, what happens is you actually want to input bits into your garbled circuit. And so to do this, we are going to use the same trick that we used before to do uh, to, to compute the LSB of X. So we are actually going to use an R for which we know the bit decomposition in so in GF2. And now we mask your or X with this R value, and we can open uh, this one time pad of X. And so we can now bit decompose uh, this new value because it's, it's not in the clear since we've opened it. And then we can input each and every bit of this value into uh, our garbled circuit. The only thing is that we now have the bit decomposition of x minus r, and so we want to add r back to, to this value. However, uh, the r has to, has to be added mod p because uh, this uh, subtraction was done uh, in GFP, right? And so basically you have to compute the modular arithmetic addition uh, in the garbled circuit world, which uh, is a bit more expensive than traditional addition. But from a programmer perspective, everything is very simple and conversion is done as such. So if you have an s gint, you can just uh, cast it into an s int and so conversion is done automatically. You should remember though that s regint are analogous to unsigned long. So when you convert uh, between an s regint, which is defined on 64 bits and a finite field element, you may have modular reduction to fit in the codomain. So as with a previous advanced type, we already have some uh, available garbled circuit. Uh, in particular, thanks to Galois, we have a binary circuit for IEEE floating point arithmetic. So using those, you can do fully IEEE compliant floating point double arithmetic within the Gable circuit engine. And you can also uh, convert back and forth between uh, such uh, a representation and the uh, S-floats that we've seen before. Finally, you may recall from previous courses that to implement speed, parties need access to, um, to shares of a BGV secret key. Uh, the issue then is how do players have actually access to this uh, sharing of the BGV key? 
So you have two choices here. One is you uh, assume that you have access to a trusted third party which can do the key distribution step for you. Or you can use a uh, specialized uh, MPC protocol to perform this key generation. Note that this MPC protocol relies on oblivious transfer and not FHG and hence doesn't require any uh, disrupted FHG key uh, to be executed, which means that you can completely remove the need to have access to a trusted third party for this setup. And that's it for this presentation. Thank you.